So we have one more talk, and I know we're a little over time, so if you have to catch a flight or something, we understand, and we're sorry. Um, so our last talk is uh, by Kimberly Collins Fennell. Um, so Kimberly is an AICPA independent objects conservator currently working in Utah. After earning her BA in visual arts from Rutgers University in 2001, she moved to France where she obtained another BA in art history from the Université François Rabelais and a specialized degree in the conservation of sculpture from the École Supérieure de, de Beaux-Arts de Tours in 2007. Since then, she has worked freelance in France and America on a wide variety of sculptures and objects from museum collections, churches, historical monuments, and private clients. And so her talk today is about uh, the conservation and restoration of two human hair wigs Thank you, Kimberly. Hello. Today I'm presenting the treatment of two human hair wigs belonging to two devotional Baroque sculptures uh, conserved at the Musée d'Art et d'Histoire de Chaumont. Uh, treatment, <laughs> let me take a breath, sorry. Treatment was completed for an exhibit there from uh, 2009 to 2010 entitled Baroque Devotion. I hope to promote awareness of these sculptures, their diverse cultural context, and the need for further research and documentation. The first wig belongs to the Holy Child under a canopy, a composite piece consisting of a polychrome sculpture dating from the late 17th to early 18th century, um, inserted into an Italian gilt altarpiece from the 18th century, along with attached fragments of gilt leather uh, from the Netherlands from the 17th century treatment of this first sculpture allowed for uh, that of the second human hair wig belonging to the Holy Child Savior of the World, a 17th century wooden polychrome sculpture and base with silk dress. These two sculptures are part of the Jacquinot collection at the Musée d'Art et d'Histoire de Chaumont. She was born in Versailles in 1891 to a rich family and Ms. Jacquinot spent her childhood in Chaumont, late, later moving to Paris where she enriched the collection that she inherited from her grandfather by purchasing pieces found at the famous Marché de Puce and the antique shops. Her collection consists of more than 800 art objects, including several gilt leather fragments, other holy child sculptures and paintings, and several Neapolitan nativity scenes. In 1967, she moved into a large residence where she exposed her collection in the 13 rooms, create, um, excuse me, uh, grouping them together by theme. Although her home did not become the museum that she wished to create, much of the collection is still in its original arrangement. The administration of the museum now uh, has, is, owner, is an owner of this building. Um, tracing the history of the wigs was challenging due to a lack of documentation of the collection, of holy child sculptures in general, of the production of wigs for devotional sculptures, and very little information on the conservation of hair. Um, with thousands of sculptures like these, and there are thousands around the world, um, they're used in very, and, and conserved in very different contexts and conditions. How can this lack of research be justified? It's widely accepted by, I'm sorry, let me go back. It's widely accepted by historians having written about the origins of the devotion to the Holy Child that the first image of the infant Jesus used in the first nativity scene came from the vision of St. Francis of Assisi on the night of Christmas 1223. This isolated image of a Jesus as a fragile infant cared for and protected by St. Francis insists on the human aspect of Jesus, particularly humility and poverty creating an intimate link between the devote and God. Over the centuries, holy child sculptures have had many functions, but their main goal was to bring the faithful closer to God through contemplation and meditation, using the senses and imagination of the individual. Numerous songs, poems, and material offerings of jewelry, richly decorated clothing, and even human hair wigs made from hair of the faithful are evidence of this intimate interaction with the sculpture. These practices are still common today. 
These sculptures were used as tools for magic and legendary interventions between the faithful and the object. Uh, they were also used as tools for divine intervention, providing protection for the people that owned them or guaranteeing fertility to young women. Uh, they were also used as pedagogical objects to teach young noble girls to care for their future children. And they were also used as symbols of social status in the community when a faithful family was allowed to host the child, child, I'm sorry, holy child sculpture in their home. They were also used as propaganda and for converting some communities to Catholicism. But one of the most important functions of the holy child, since the majority of these sculptures originate in monasteries and convents, is that they served as a symbol of the mystical marriage between a young nun and God. In the 17th century in Spain, it was common for a male member of a noble family, either the father and uncle, to commission a holy child sculpture to offer to his daughter or niece upon her entrance into the convent. It was to protect her virginity and guarantee her education. According to tradition, the girls aged from two to six rece received three objects, a basket of sewing notions, a crucifix, and their own holy child. For many of these very young girls, the sculpture represented the only contact that she would have with a man, either until marriage or death, not having outside contact with her family once in the convent. <laughs> Sounds like I'm going to cry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I probably should. Um, <laughs> if, if, the, if the young girl prepared herself uh, for marriage, the holy child symbolically represented her virginity and implied that she was ready to raise children. When the young fiancé left the convent or monastery, she could keep the holy child as a souvenir of her link to her family or as a tool to raise her own future children. Often they were donated to the convent because the husband refused to take them into his house. <laughs> That's why there are so many, right? <laughs> um, if the young girl remained in the convent, destined to become a nun, she kept and cared for her holy child sculpture, which became a symbol of her mystical marriage with Jesus. For her statue was the equivalent of wife of God, father, and son. In this way, the sculpture was often called husband, and it became symbolically the husband and the son of the nun. <laughs> These faithful, and I shouldn't, I shouldn't, sorry, it's, I think in our society today, it's um, very surprising but for a lot of people, it, still today, it's not, so excuse me. Um, <laughs> these faithful invested themselves both physically and psychologically in the care of their holy child sculptures. They made and repaired rich silk clothing embroidered with gold and silver thread, shoes, socks, underwear, for example, to clothe him. In Flanders, Germany, Italy, and Spain, the nuns were meant to caress them, cuddle them, kiss them, bathe them, walk them, and even play with them. I've seen some paintings of nuns playing cards with their holy child sculptures. Um, many different rituals and religious festivities and processions during the Catholic calendar implied preparations of these sculptures, much like ones still practiced today. Although this example is a 17th century sculpture of the Virgin Mary from the Cathedral of Tudela in northern Spain, there are documented accounts of two different wigs used for this sculpture. The everyday wig was made of blonde hair cut from Maria Rosa, I'm sorry, Maria Rosa Eregui when she was seven years old, and the processional wig was made of brown hair from another girl, Maria Alaba, cut when she was 15 on May 31st, 1921. So even though these are more recent, it's still something that is uh, practiced today. A silk ribbon sewn into this last wig bears a poem written by her uncle to dedicate the offering of her hair to the Virgin Mary, asking for protection in return. So human hair wigs can be extremely important symbolic offerings to these objects of devotion, evidence of a very intimate bond between the sculpture and the faithful. <coughs> the Holy Child under a canopy is a composite work put together during the 20th century with three older elements, the Holy Child, the altarpiece, and the gilt of their fragments. The assembly of these elements created a new work of art which conditions its interpretation and conservation. The first is the Holy Child of the Passion, which is a different iconography of the other one that we're going to see later. 
He is wearing a human hair wig, and he is found without his typical, typical accessories, the cross and a basket with the symbols of the passion and probably clothing. Uh, this, this theme was very popular in Spain and Italy at the time. When considering the delicate question of provenance, the Holy Child sculpture is comparable to examples from Andalusia of the same period through its facial expression and the inclusion of separate intermediate arm pieces that are non-articulated, as you can see in the image below. However, the style and technique of the eyes seem to be more similar to its contemporary Holy Child in Italy. These are examples. Um, <clears throat> okay. The fact that this sculpture is made of lime wood also argues in favor of an Italian production. That being said, the Kingdom of Naples being part of Spanish territories during a major part of the 17th and 18th centuries, the materials, artwork, and artists circulated very frequently between the two regions. As for the origin and date, sorry, these are the Spanish examples below that look slightly different. Uh, you can see the uh, painted eyelashes, for example, and <clears throat> teardrops made of resin or glass. Um, as for the origin and date of the human hair wig belonging to this holy child, there's not enough documentation to provide a clear answer. A part down the middle is not clearly defined, which does not correspond to the majority of wigs observed. <clears throat> Jose Luis Romero Torres, curator specialized in Baroque sculpture of Andalusia, has confirmed this. An observation of the vast collection of documented Italian holy child sculptures uh, with rather sophisticated wigs of the Hickey collection show little similarities in style with this wig. Okay, so um, I've, I was in contact with lots of people uh, to work on this project, so I've, I'm gonna recognize everybody that I talked to. So sorry, this is a bit lengthy, but I feel it's important to mention their names. Uh, Samy Audin, the director of the Musée de la Poupée in Paris, claims that this wig corresponds perfectly to the style and technique of fabrication of wigs in Naples from the late 17th to early 18th century. Um, I had many diverging opinions from people that I consulted, and uh, with the lack of documentation, um, it made it very difficult for me to come to a conclusion. Um, so there's nothing that proves that this wig is original or belongs to this, this sculpture, but nothing that proves the contrary. Unlike the previous sculpture, the Holy Child's savior of the world seems to be more obviously dated from 17th century Spain <clears throat> based on stylistic comparisons with similar documented sculptures. Its original polychrome layer is consistent with 17th century Spanish Baroque techniques and materials as well. However, it seems very likely that this wig is not original. There are several holes at the top of the head, <clears throat> one of which is one centimeter in diameter and four centimeters deep, where typically the stem of a precious decorative metal halo, nimbus, or crown would be inserted, as seen on earlier 17th century sculptures. Four smaller holes following a central line from the forehead to the crown exist, probably made to attach a wig or other accessories to the head. The observation of the method of fabrication of the wig suggests that it was produced in mass with a number stamped on the interior of the fabric, possibly corresponding to a size. The wig seems to be a later addition to replace an earlier one that had either gone out of style or was in poor condition. There are both holes at the top of the head intended to receive at least one attribute and a painted crown of the head which indicates that there would be a wig. Okay, so it is probably not original. Prior to treatment, the, Holy Ch the first sculpture, Holy Child Under a Canopy, was conserved in the reserves of the museum, hung on a wall <clears throat> with the deformed wig laying lopsided on the head. The conditions during the past 30 years include little to no heating, repeated water infiltration, fluctuating temperature and relative humidity, a very little exposure to natural or artificial light, and no protection from dust and pests. The Holy Child Savior of the World was conserved unprotected from dust and dirt in an office of the same building. Visual comparison under microscope with human hair confirmed that the hair used in both wigs is human. The ends of the curls examined shown that they, uh, show that they were cut straight with scissors. 
It's not very surprising. <laughs> the wig of the holy child under a canopy consists of brown human hair, cotton thread, and iron wire. The mass of shoulder-length curled hair, varying from 5 to 17 centimeters in length, is attached to a wire structure approximately 15 centimeters in diameter. It's in the general form of a flower that fits the form of the crown of the head of the holy child, as you can see on this x-ray. This wig is held in place thanks to a single iron nail, one centimeter in length protruding from uh, the ha hairline. And after detailed observation of the wig, the technique of fabrication by steps are as follows. An iron wire is attached between, between two pegs on a truss frame, following the same principle as the one used in the 18th century to make wigs, as seen here in the Encyclopedia of Diderot d'Alembert. The cut hairs, roughly 40 centimeters in length, are placed on the wire at their half in step two, uh, 20 centimeters on either side of the wire. Then the black cotton thread is threaded between groups of 10 to 20 strands of hair. The threading is continued until there are three rows of thread that separate these small groups of hair and the wire, it is then attached to the wire with threads, folded and shaped into a form in order to ob obtain a structure that'll fit on the crown of the head. I'll, prob I'll just pass that. You can see it's, it seemed like it took a lot of time. It's very complicated, uh, or not that complicated, but uh, it's definitely handmade. Okay. So this technique suggests that the hair was curled afterwards, and curling the hair was most likely achieved using tools of the time, uh, such as a curling iron or curlers. Samples of the hair were sent to the Museum uh, d'Histoire Naturelle in Paris, where traces of a very fine transparent substance on the hairs were detected, possibly corresponding to our modern hairspray. Although not, no documentation has been found at present concerning the use uh, I'm sorry, concerning the different techniques of fabrication of wigs, according to period and country, or the artisans who made them, or even the nuns, one can at least argue that this wig properly fits the shape of the, of the sculpture, and it was most likely not mass-produced, given the irregularities and several steps involved. The wig of the Holy Child Savior of the World consists of blonde curled human hair at shoulder length with a slight part down the middle. The hair is attached by cotton thread to a cotton textile base made of more than one pieces of fabric sewn together to form the base. This seems to have been accomplished with a machine simply because of the regularity of spacing between holes, identical appearance of holes and threading. One can suggest that the hair was prepared in a similar fashion as the hair of the wig that we previously saw. Instead of using a wire, it was uh, put onto threads. The hair was then most likely sewn onto the fabric in concentric circles oh. uh, along the upper part of the wig, stopping at four centimeters from the base of the wig. The presence of a stamp number 10 in black ink on the anterior base of the wig, as well as the regularity of the stitching, suggests that it was produced with many others in different sizes, probably by an artisan wig maker. A greenish powder-like substance observed on the hair, in particular on the top of the head, suggests the use of an unknown product intended to change the aspect of the hair. This could possibly be a substance used to either clean the hair prior to use on the wig, or residue of a treatment using indigo in the prevention of yellowing of this lighter colored hair. This is a technique documented by colonial wig makers in Williamsburg, Virginia during the 18th century. This same account mentions the use of fine sand and sawdust, among other materials, and the boiling, drying, and even baking of hair wigs in rye bread loaves uh, in order to completely clean the hair for use in wigs. A sample was taken, but unfortunately not uh, analyzed yet. This was 10 years ago, so it's probably not going to happen. <laughs> um, both wigs have very similar alterations and degradations. Due to the physical nature and conditions of poor conservation, the hair had collected over time a great amount of dust and debris, in, in particular on the tops of the wigs and all throughout the curls. Signs of infestation were obvious, as several carcasses and dried traces of larvae of hair-eating insects were found in both wigs. 
These are most likely a type of carpet beetle from the genus Anthrinus, from the Dermistid family, a parasite that we saw already, um, that feeds on animal hairs, and especially in the dark, which corresponds to the conditions of the museum. As a consequence, many hairs are broken, very fragile, and extremely dirty. The traces of spray on this wig could be a factor leading to even more stress uh, on these hairs. Oh, um, in the case of the second wig, a whole set, no, of the same wig, I'm sorry, a strand of hair was broken off, probably eaten away, and just um, laying on the tangled hair in the back. So it was decided um, after researching different types of consolidation, it was probably safer to just preserve it um, in acid-free tissue paper and document that. Okay. So goals for treatment included stopping the deterioration and improving the appearance of the wigs, helping the visitor to correctly read their intended forms. Um, both wigs were first treated for infestation using an anoxic treatment. Sorry about that. Um, because of the very fragile state of the hair, each curl was noted on a drawing um, in order to, to make sure that if during treatment uh, one of them might be uh, misplaced, we could put it back where it belonged. Um, we did not have the same problem with the wig of the Holy Child Savior of the World. The wigs were then mechanically cleaned with soft brushes and a low-powered vacuum cleaner in order to remove the remains of infestation and debris. Dampened cotton wrapped around the end of tweezers and bamboo skewers were useful to remove stubborn stains. I'm sorry, traces of insect matter stuck to some strands of hair. Dirt, grime, and residue on both wigs remained after the preliminary cleaning, leaving the curls stiff and dull in appearance and texture. The wigs were very loosely uh, attached to small plastic sieves using a nylon thread and pre-existing holes of the sieve and the wig, um, providing support for the wig, minimizing handling, allowing for strands of hair to dry vertically, and encouraging air circulation through the wig during treatment. A series of tests was carried out in order to find the most appropriate method for the two wigs, a method of cleaning. Uh, the few existing articles on conservation treatment of hair and collections provided uh, similar cleaning concerns, but the objects uh, that I found uh, in these articles were in very different conditions than the wigs. They were mainly archaeological. The Museum d'Histoire Naturelle in Paris suggested that I contact the Musée de la Poupée, which is a doll. Um, rec they recommended to me to clean uh, the hair with baby shampoo and water, which is what they use. Um, after considering the ingredients of the latter, the results of tested solvents and mixtures and aiming for the least invasive and most effective method, the best results were obtained using a mixture of demineralized water and one drop of non-ionic detergent uh, Triton X100. I'm, I'm not sure if that's how that's pronounced, but I think it is. Um, <laughs> in order to avoid rubbing that could possibly damage the cuticle, I'm sorry, that one strand, uh, probably can't see it from back there, but that was the result. You can actually see the color of the hair appear underneath uh, the layers of dirt and grime. Um, so in, in order to avoid rubbing that could damage the cuticle, uh, cleaning was performed in a bath, curl by curl, in the recipient of an ultrasonic humidifier. This method avoids all mechanical action on the strand of hair and allows for cleaning without pulling on already damaged hairs avoiding an eventual rupture or removal from the wig. The hair is soaked in the bath curl by curl two to four minutes. And the entire wigs could not be fully soaked in the baths because of the presence of iron in one and cotton and ink in the other. Also, this method allowed to move slowly and carefully curl by curl without needing to care for all of them at the same time. The cleaning mixture was changed and re renewed very frequently as soon as the water in the recipient became dirty. The clean curl was then rinsed in a separate recipient, wrapped around a soft foam curler that was closest as possible to the size of the original curl, and allowed to air dry. I'm going to drink some water. <laughs> the cleaned and rinsed hair was shiny and supple. 
not one single curl was undone in order to respect the amount of strands per curl and the form of the hairs of each curl. Once the curled hair was dry, the foam curler was removed and the curl was very lightly arranged by hand in order to restore volume to the curl. No detangling was performed, which would have certainly provoked the loss of many hairs. That was a compromise that we had to make. The newfound flexibility and very supple hair of the wigs held their curls very well. Uh, it was therefore judged unnecessary to apply any type of fixative to keep the shape. It should also be noted that the hair retained its curl when it was wet, so it was very easy to just insert the curl. The wig of the Holy Child Savior of the World presented hair in a much better overall condition regarding the strength and flexibility of the hairs. Although the curls had become deformed, <coughs> there were very little breaks in strands and no loose strands laying entangled in others. For these reasons, a test by swapping was undertaken on one curl and the cuticles of the hairs observed under microscope were unchanged. The cleaning was performed by soaking the curls one by one in a recipient. A light cotton swab was used, sorry, go back, um, when judged necessary, using the same cleaning mixture, curl by curl over absorbent paper laid underneath each curl during cleaning and rinsing until the paper showed no more dirt. Uh, the mixture was renewed frequently. Rinsing and drying were performed in the same manner as for the first wig. The cotton support of the wig was superficially cleaned with demineralized water, uh, on cotton swabs left to air dry on the plastic sieve support in order to conserve the shape. After treatment of the wig of the Holy Child under a canopy, there's before and after. <laughs> um, the, the Holy Child uh, under a canopy was, after treatment was put back in place into the altar after treatment with a removable wedge allowing proper positioning and avoiding any contact between the wig and the gilt leather. Here's the final after treatment. The wig of the Holy Child Savior of the World was placed upon the head of the treated Holy Child as well, having a better fit than before treatment. Despite the poor state of these pieces prior to treatment, the conservation and restoration of these wigs and sculptures allow the spectator to better appreciate their aesthetic qualities more in harmony with their style and iconography. <laughs> I'd like to just stop right there. I just have one last paragraph. <laughs> um, although the study and treatment allow us to better understand these sculptures and their context, more documentation of their production, their provenance, their stylistic and technical differences would be extremely useful. Although these sculptures, I'm sorry, also these sculptures do not have the privilege of being considered as important as other devotional religious sculptures commissioned by the church or the wealthy, so very little effort has been made to include them in art historical studies. Um, in Spain, the art historians explained to me that they were basically classified as Spanish or Neapolitan, depending generally on the quality of the sculpted forms. From a conservator's point of view, guidelines for handling and treatment procedures of hair objects like these would be very beneficial to those who care for them, given the high number of similar objects in collections, churches, and monasteries, especially since these objects have an impact on a large number of people who either use or still care for them. Um, I'd like to thank not, I'm not going to thank everybody on <laughs> uh, right now on this screen, uh, but I do want to thank the museum in France, the Musée d'Histoire uh, d'Histoire de Chaumont. I also want to thank Louise Bacon, who uh, encouraged me to uh, participate in the first, uh, the first conference on the conservation of hair in 2014 at the Horniman Museum in London. And I really want to thank all of you, WAC, Randy, for encouraging me to participate. I'm sorry about my voice. You made it. <laughs> Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Oh, where, where was the question? Can, uh, actually, one question for you. It looked like, were you, were you using that, uh, the humidifier basically in the manner of an ultrasonic cleaning bath? 
Did I get that right? I, yes, I would put the curl actually into the recipient instead of using the nozzle to clean um, as okay. traditionally would. It, it worked it as well as you would expect for an ultrasound cleaner? It was excellent. I mean, after looking at the hair underneath the microscope, you couldn't see the cuticles. There was no residue, um, very little amount of detergent, one drop per liter of water. So I, I liked, I liked the results. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Could we have one final round of applause for all of our speakers today? It was wonderful. <laughs>